66 million years ago. Just off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, in what is now the northeast coast of modern Mexico, a herd of spectacular creatures is on the move. About 30 Taurosaurus, very similar in appearance to its northern cousin Triceratops, are traveling in search of new areas to feed. The tropical climate of the peninsula brings breezes in from the sea, and the dinosaurs have gathered by the rocky shore to feed on the rich vegetation in the forests that surround the coastline. High above, an iconic giant of the Mesozoic soars from island to island. Quetzalcoatlus, a famous pterosaur, the size of a small plane. Feeding on the invertebrates within the debris kicked up by the moving herd of Taurosaurus is Ogeraptosaurus, a brightly colored feathered oviraptorid, which poses no threat to the horned giant's shadows. The trees of the nearby forest cast their shadows over the herd. And within those trees, small mammals are darting in and out of the vegetation to avoid predators that lurk within a dense undergrowth. The adjacent sea is home to a rich myriad of wildlife. Fossils of both bony and cartilaginous fish, as well as amphibians and turtles, have been found here. It is a rich ecosystem, blossoming with life. Everywhere you look, there's something going on. Something to see. Strange and unfamiliar creatures to observe. It is the culmination of millions of years of evolutionary work. 180 million years, to be precise. The dynasty of the dinosaurs, beginning in the late Triassic period, and giving rise to a group of animals that would quite literally rule the Earth for the entire Mesozoic era, reached its zenith in the Cretaceous period, which was, unfortunately, about to come to a cataclysmic end. Recently visible to the naked eye, in the clear, unpolluted Cretaceous night skies of Mexico, is a bright star-like object, hurtling towards the Earth at 25 kilometers a second. The object is an asteroid measuring 15 kilometers across, gradually closing the distance between itself and our planet on a direct collision course. As it gradually appears larger and larger in the sky, the creatures below are entirely oblivious. Perhaps a dinosaur may have looked up and acknowledged it at some point in those final days, but there's no way of telling or preventing what was to come. Eventually, the asteroid would collide with planet Earth, landing just off the Gulf of Mexico, a stone's throw from where our Taurosaurus herd was traveling, with such great force that it would firmly mark the end of not only them, but all of their fellow non-avian dinosaurs. A total of 75% of all species of organism on planet Earth would soon become extinct in what was to become known as the Chicxulub impact. When the asteroid did eventually hit, it was utterly catastrophic. Although it wasn't the most deadly mass extinction event in Earth's history, that glory goes to the end Permian extinction or the Great Dying, as it has lovingly come to be known. Chicxulub is by far the most well-known, and we do know a great deal about it. The asteroid smashed straight into the shallow, tropical sea surrounding the Gulf of Mexico, and when it hit, the impact was more powerful and contained more energy than over four and a half billion Hiroshima or Nagasaki nuclear bombs, or 100 teratons of TNT. Just one teraton is a 13-figure number. For even further comparison, the most powerful man-made explosion ever detonated, the Tsar Bomba, 
released a comparatively tiny one million tons. As you can imagine, every life form directly underneath the impact was instantly done for. When the asteroid slammed into the Earth, a huge pulse of infrared radiation was released, which would have disintegrated every single organism in its range. A gigantic shockwave, very much like a nuclear bomb, would have blasted across the land, with wind speeds of around 1,000 kilometers per hour present at ground zero. This shockwave would have pulsed far away from the impact site, kicking up colossal tsunamis from the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, which would have battered the coastlines of the Western Hemisphere, hurling Earth, trees, and dinosaurs alike into the air, or washing them away entirely. Earthquakes would also have been rife in those first moments and days, as the impact would have slammed so hard into the crust of the Earth that the tectonic plates themselves were shifted, the natural disasters alone would have killed billions upon billions of organisms, as the infrared radiation caused by the immediate impact burned not only life in its direct path, but much of the land across the Americas, as huge wildfires were ignited across the continents. Dinosaurs and other animals that would have depended on these forests would have been trapped succumbing either to the flames or the heavy smoke. As well as the wildfires, huge firestorms would have been sweeping over the continent, immolating everything in its path. The dinosaurs that perished from the initial effects of the asteroid impact would have been comparatively lucky. The creatures of North and South America, closest to ground zero, would have been killed quickly and with great force. The natural disasters brought on by the radiation and the shockwave would have choked the land, erasing whole food webs and ecosystems one by one, resulting in a much more difficult and harrowing existence for those not taken by the initial blast. Forests and jungle were burned. The coastlines and flatland were ravaged by the tidal waves, and many species of plant relied upon by so many creatures were wiped out. What awaited the remaining dinosaurs was a slow, agonizing extinction, as dust and soot were shot up into the atmosphere. This would have created a cold, dark, global winter effect, as the particles cloaked the globe in seemingly perpetual gloom. So much dust was kicked up into the atmosphere, in fact, that the sun ceased to shine on Earth for an entire year. The sheer levels of it covering the sky were too thick for light to penetrate. What made matters even worse is that the Chicxulub asteroid hit a large area of Earth's crust composed of carbonate rock. The rock it hit was rich in highly combustible hydrocarbons and sulfur that, when mixed with the radiation and the intense flames, would have launched deadly sulfuric acid aerosols into the atmosphere, along with the dust and soot. This caused a further 50% reduction in sunlight, making it even more difficult for life on Earth. As a result of this, Earth's plants could no longer photosynthesize. There was simply not enough sunlight for them to sustain themselves for long. And in turn, 57% of all plant species ended up becoming extinct. The plants were in no way assisted by the acid rain which battered the earth following the deposition of sulfuric acid aerosols into the atmosphere. Ten long years of acid rain cascaded down onto the vegetation of this post-apocalyptic world, killing off the plants of the land and the phytoplankton of the seas the world over, herbivorous animals were losing their food sources. The next step of this grisly chain reaction was for the loss of the plants 
to slowly begin starving the ecosystems of the prehistoric world. With no vegetation, herbivores either could not eat or came within direct competition of one another in a desperate attempt to sustain themselves. Animals that are specialists, highly adapted to exploit a particular food source, were doomed from the start as they could not adapt to the rapid change and loss of plant life. The Ornithischian dinosaurs and the sauropods then were on their way out. Triceratops is theorized to have been one of the last surviving species of herbivorous dinosaur. And alongside it, species of gigantic titanosaur, once the towering lords of the earth, would have begun dropping like flies. These animals needed a lot of food to sustain them, and without a reliable source of it, their days were numbered. With plenty of newly deceased dinosaur bodies littering the land, the scavengers would have had a field day. Some dinosaurs, as well as many other surviving creatures that fed on carrion, would have been able to temporarily gorge themselves. Eventually, however, that source too would have run dry, resulting in many starving theropod dinosaurs. Before long, there simply wasn't enough meat left to sustain such large animals, and the non-avian dinosaurs met their untimely demise in extinction. Meanwhile, in the oceans, similar catastrophes were unfolding. The acid rain acidified the oceanic and riverine bodies of water across the world, meaning that shelled creatures that construct their shells out of natural calcium carbonate such as corals, clams, oysters, and mussels, were killed off. A similar thing to what was simultaneously going on on the surface was now happening beneath the waves. Creatures that depended on the shellfish, as well as the phytoplankton that was destroyed by the acidification of the waters, died when the food sources depleted. With them, in turn, went the large predators of the late Cretaceous seas. Mosasaurs and plesiosaurs disappeared when the fish and reptiles they depended upon went extinct. With the mass extinction underway and the sun blocked out, the planet was plunged into three years of freezing temperatures. Any stragglers would have struggled to keep up with the lack of sunlight and the cold temperatures it brought with it and would have, eventually, succumbed as a result. However, this was not the end of life on Earth. If it was, you would not be here today watching this video. Although life took some incredibly heavy losses, it would bounce back in new and wondrous forms in the Cenozoic Era, otherwise known as the Age of Mammals. The most distinct change for the years that followed the asteroid impact, however, was to be found in the plant life. The evolutionary niches left behind by the plants that became extinct in the impact were soon to be filled by the evolution of new species. More and more plants were able to evolve and diversify as the world warmed back up, which set off a chain reaction of events leading to the establishment of huge tracts of neotropical rainforest across the world in the Paleocene Epoch, the period of time that would follow the Chicxulub asteroid impact. With the megafauna, which included dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and marine reptiles gone, planet Earth was a dark, cold world full of tiny creatures. The mammals, a class of animals that had been steadily evolving alongside the dinosaurs, inhabiting the thick undergrowth of Earth's forests throughout the Mesozoic, were the most noticeable in the immediate aftermath. The mammals survived in diverse groups, but many species were killed off in the disaster. It is the mammals that represent the success story of the Chicxulub asteroid impact. 
they would go on to rise up in the ashes of the dinosaurs and inherit the earth as their own in the millennia to come. The largest of the mammals throughout the time of the dinosaurs was no larger than a small dog. They were diminutive creatures that were unobtrusive and easy to miss amidst the chaos and vibrancy exhibited by the dinosaurs. Amongst the groups that survived were the monotremes, distant ancestors of modern echidnas and the platypus, a now small group of strange egg-laying mammals native to Australia. Early marsupials joined them, preferring the safety of the trees to escape the predators of the forest floor. Somewhere deep within the neotropical forests of the recovering world was the ancestor of all of us, a distant relative to the first true primates. The mammals would go on to truly conquer the swiftly approaching Cenozoic era, diversifying into outlandish new forms. All of the great, opportunistic survivors of Chicxulub laid the foundations for all the mammals we recognize today to evolve. From the largest whale to the tiniest mouse, and ultimately to us. Although non-avian dinosaurs went extinct in the catastrophe, the avian ones, more commonly referred to as birds, did not. Or at least not all of them. The enantiornithine birds, a group that was extremely widespread and diverse across the Mesozoic, would go extinct, as would the Hesperornithoforms, a penguin-like group of long-necked diving birds. The first avian dinosaurs to evolve that still exist today were the ratites, gigantic flightless relatives of the ostrich, emu, rhea, cassowary, and kiwi. They were already established by the Cretaceous, but went on to produce the largest birds that would ever live. Following them were the Ansuriforms, the group containing ducks and geese, and the Galliforms, which contain modern-day chickens, grouse, and pheasants. Early relatives of flamingos and owls inhabited the neotropical Paleocene forests, bearing an uncanny resemblance to their modern descendants. Many other groups would rise throughout the Cenozoic, among the early inhabitants of the era would be Gastornis, a huge creature with a big, broad beak, which scientists still can't decide whether it was used to pick fruit or kill prey. The non-dinosaurian reptiles did very well indeed, following the aftermath of the extinction. 80% of turtle species survived and there is a representative from every family that is still alive today. Crocodiles did exceedingly well and remained some of the most feared and powerful predators of the Cenozoic. Their age-old ancestry continues today in our modern crocodilians. Amphibians arguably did the best of all, being a hardy group of small, adaptable creatures. They could easily survive the extinction and as a result, almost all species survived. Fish, however, faced a mixed bag of results. The largest fish, unable to sustain themselves on the dwindling stocks of reliable food, perished in the aftermath. And many species of shark and ray disappeared, leaving us with our existing orders and families that have slowly been diversifying over the Cenozoic. 90% of all bony fish survived, and the fish that lived at the very bottom of the oceans in perpetual darkness wouldn't really have felt much of an effect at all, carrying on with their lives and continuing to exist and evolve. As for the invertebrates, things are a bit hazy. The fossil record for various classes and orders of invertebrates varies greatly in the fossil record from the particular extinction time. But this may be down to a lack of fossils rather than a mass extinction of invertebrates. 
We know that arthropods, for example, have gone on to become the most numerous and diverse of all creatures, with millions of species present today, and they must have been diverse and rather successful at the time of the extinction. Otherwise, we could have expected many more larger creatures that depended on them as food to go extinct too. Invertebrates ultimately went on to thrive, resulting in the diversity we see today. Insects, arachnids, crustaceans, jellyfish, echinoderms, sponges, corals, all represent many vital components of many food webs the world over. Ultimately, the end Cretaceous extinction event is known more famously from what it took from the world rather than what evolved as a result of it. Every non-avian dinosaur, from the smallest theropods to the largest sauropods, would perish in the disasters. Unable to cope with the dwindling food sources and the natural disasters that were so persistently ravaging the land, they perished. Along with them went the gigantic marine reptiles, the long-necked plesiosaurs and the short-necked pliosaurs, as well as the snake-like apex predator mosasaurs. High above, the pterosaurs that didn't burn up from the infrared radiation perished along the cliffs and islets of the Cretaceous coastline, putting an end to the majesty of one of the most spectacular lineages of reptiles the world has ever seen. To understand the history of Chicxulub's discovery, we have to travel back to 1970, where American geologist Walter Alvarez and his father, Luis Alvarez, a physicist, put forward the idea that an asteroid impact killed off the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. Their evidence was to be found not in Mexico, but rather in Italy, where they had noted a particularly thin layer of clay that was very high in iridium, a type of metal which is rare on Earth, but conveniently common in asteroids. Subsequently, Similar examples were popping up across the world throughout the course of the 1980s, which provided little bits of backing to his claim. However, no impact craters had been located that would account for such a colossal mass extinction. Such a crater would need to be gigantic if it was to have the effect that Alvarez and Alvarez proposed it would. Fast forward to 1978, and geophysicists Glenn Penfield and Antonio Camargo were conducting a magnetic survey on the far eastern coast of Mexico, near the Yucatan Peninsula, in order to find suitable locations for the oil company Petróleos Mexicanos, or Pemex, to drill. When conducting their survey, they discovered something of an anomaly in the otherwise nondescript offshore landscape. Amongst the earth they were surveying was a huge magnetic area, 180 kilometers in width. Could this have been a solid piece of evidence that would back up the Alvarez's claims? Unfortunately, the scientists did not have a clear path ahead of them. Pemex initially rejected the idea that a huge crater was present in the area, proposing that it was instead the product of mass volcanic activity. They withheld Penfield and Camargo from releasing all of their findings surrounding their studies, but permitted them to present a good amount of them a few years later at the 1981 Society of Exploration Geophysicists Conference. Surely, this was the break the theory needed to get itself out there. Again, there were more hurdles. The conference was very poorly attended in 1981, so very few people were there to hear Penfield and Camargo's findings. Even though journalists were contacting the pair to make their story public, the news still traveled too slowly for word to really get out. 
Penfield then had another idea. He had lots of data to back up his ideas, but the evidence, the physical samples, or rock cores he would need to prove his point, were absent still. If he could just get some samples, perhaps people would listen. Pemex had drilled in the area previously, in 1951, so it was possible that some samples still existed, which would have been very convenient for Penfield. Pursuing this lead turned out to be fruitless. The samples had been lost since the expedition. Even returning to the drill site didn't get him anywhere, and he was unable to find anything concrete enough to back his ideas up. Publishing his findings anyway, he subsequently abandoned his mission and resumed his work with Pemex. The story, as you can imagine, does not end there though. Elsewhere, other scientists were searching for the proposed crater that may have put an end to the reign of the dinosaurs. Walter Alvarez was among them, but he was looking in the wrong places. It wasn't until 1990 when two scientists from the University of Arizona, Alan R. Hildebrand, a graduate student, and William V. Boynton, a faculty advisor, looked for the crater around the area of the Brazos River in Texas that things started to pick up the pace. They discovered a site of greenish-brown clay, rich in iridium, similar to the initial discoveries in Italy. But there was more. This clay contained tektites, small beads of glass found in asteroids, as well as shocked quartz grains. Tektites are exclusively found in asteroids, meaning that, judging by the time period the rocks were dated from, at the end of the Cretaceous, a massive asteroid must have smashed into Earth. Further studies proved even more fruitful the surrounding area of the Chicxulub crater was also rich in tektites, and the crater itself is thought to be a much, much larger 300 kilometers wide. The crater initially studied by Glenn Penfield and Antonio Camargo in 1978 was now thought to be a leading or even the direct cause of the mass extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. It was given the name Chicxulub, after a nearby Mexican town of the same name. Since the extinction of the dinosaurs became common knowledge, scientists have been putting forward their own reasons as to why the great reptiles disappeared. If you pick up a popular dinosaur book from your childhood, you might see an artist's rendition of the asteroid soaring over the head of an outdated-looking Tyrannosaurus or Triceratops, the two dinosaurs vacantly acknowledging the impending disaster as it rushes overhead. If you don't see that, then it might be a depiction of a volcano spewing lava and ash into the sky in the background of an image that shows similar creatures. It has taken scientists a long time to decide on what it was that actually wiped out the dinosaurs. And to this day, they still aren't 100% certain they have the right answer with Chicxulub. Several other theories stand, all of which are equally likely. Aside from Chicxulub, the main running theory is that volcanic activity caused the dinosaurs to become extinct. The volcanoes in question have been identified as the Deccan Traps, a huge area of igneous rock in western India that hides a massive shield volcano. Between 67 and 63 million years ago, coinciding with the Chicxulub impact, an eruption took place in the area which would have been catastrophic for wildlife. Some theories state that the two disasters had a direct link. Chicxulub's impact may have worsened the eruption, combining the two to cause a cataclysmic mass extinction. The rock would have become more permeable after the impact, allowing 70% more magma to flow through, 
devastating the surrounding landscape. On top of this, volcanic gases that were toxic to the planet's animal life would have been spewed into the air, which additionally caused extensive climate change. It wouldn't have been the first time that volcanism has contributed to the mass extinction of Earth's wildlife. The Great Dying, the worst mass extinction of all time, taking place at the end of the Permian period, before the Triassic, is thought to have been caused by mass volcanism, where volcanoes all across the globe erupted subsequently. A second reason for the extinction can be found in the multiple impact theory. This one adds to what we already have with Chicxulub, stating that lots of asteroids hit Earth around the same time across the globe. This theory actually preceded the discovery of Chicxulub and caused a lot of controversy at the time it was published. Once Chicxulub was located, however, asteroid impact theories began to assimilate into popular science and Chicxulub is now the single leading theory of a direct cause. It is not out of the question that there could have been multiple impacts based on the iridium spikes found in other areas of the globe but the science behind this theory is still in the works. Scientists cannot yet prove for certain that multiple impact theory is definitely true. Towards the end of the Cretaceous, the world witnessed a frightening drop in sea levels in an event paleontologists have named the Maastrichtian Sea Level Regression. Such an event takes place when the area of Earth's crust previously submerged underwater is pushed above sea level, forcing the oceans to recede. Scientists know that this took place at the end of the Cretaceous, which may have contributed to the mass extinction of marine life around that time, suggesting that the great creatures of the ocean were already dwindling in numbers around the time the asteroid hit, finishing them off. The regression of the sea level is then theorized to have caused rapid climate change due to a disruption of the winds and ocean currents, forcing dinosaurs and other terrestrial animals to lose their habitats, unable to adapt to the quick changes. Or perhaps it was a combination of several or all of these theories that wiped out the dinosaurs. We know for a fact that a massive asteroid hit the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous period and in the area that would one day become eastern Mexico. The consequences of such an impact would have been terrifying, causing widespread death and destruction all over the surface of the Earth. It is likely that other disasters, such as the eruption of the Deccan Traps volcano, could have been worsened by the asteroid impact so it's a good idea to be open to these alternative theories. Either way, the dinosaurs were doomed from the start. Nothing could have been done to prevent the loss of these creatures, but their extinctions would allow many other groups of animals to rise up in their wake. The mass extinction of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period 66 million years ago. Whether or not it was caused by the Chicxulub asteroid impact can teach us many things about not only the natural world, but life itself. To quote a certain 1993 science fiction film, life finds a way. We would most certainly not be here today if it wasn't for the extinction. Sapiens or a form of advanced intelligence could well have eventually risen up amongst the cunning dromaeosaurs, for example. But humans would not have had scope to evolve if the dinosaurs had not died out. The destruction of the dinosaur lineage was terrible, yes, and it was something that no species should have to endure. But the subsequent Cenozoic period brought about unprecedented and rapid change amongst the world's mammal populations. Within a few million years of the extinction event, lineages of creatures were evolving that would be recognizable today. 
Some of the first creatures to take shape were the monotremes and marsupials, swiftly followed by the bats and early ancestors of sloths. Even the first early whales, strange semi-aquatic hoofed creatures, were beginning to evolve by the end of the Paleocene Epoch. Life took on bizarre and wonderful new forms, like nothing the Earth had ever seen up to that point. Like many dinosaur enthusiasts, you may find yourself wondering what it must have been like to see a living, breathing dinosaur. But look no further than the birds outside your window. They may be visually different, but birds are dinosaurs, direct ancestors of theropods. The lives we lost at Chicxulub live on to this very day. Perhaps we can look at Chicxulub and the mass extinction it caused as a cautionary tale. We are living in what may well turn out to be the sixth mass extinction right now. We are losing species of modern animals to extinction at an unprecedented rate due to our reckless destruction of the Earth's precious natural habitats. If we act now, there's still hope, but we need to be fast. We cannot afford for a repeat of something as catastrophic as the end Cretaceous extinction to take place in modern day.